Anyway, I'd like to introduce our next presenter, who's going to be Sanjay Rahman. He's going to tell us about his analysis of the photon identification mechanism in the CMS 2016 data. Um, and he worked just with his mentors, Professor Christoph Paus and Mr. Brandon Allen. So good afternoon, everyone. So I'd like to start by introducing some of the motivation for my research. And that motivation lies in the search for dark matter, which is one of the most important problems in physics today. So what is dark matter? Well, in the 1930s, astrophysicists observed a discrepancy between the theoretically predicted rotation curves of galaxies and what was actually observed. So here is the theoretically predicted distribution of velocities of stars in a galaxy plotted as a function of radial distance in the dotted line, and here are the observed data points. So what would explain the discrepancy? Well, astrophysicists came up with a model of matter that did not interact with light to explain the differences between what was observed and what was predicted. And the nature of this dark matter has been a mystery ever since. So how are we trying to find out what dark matter is? Well, if dark matter is in particle form, we're trying three different approaches to detect these dark matter particles. So first we have direct detection, as shown here, which involves a dark matter particle scattering off a standard model particle to produce an observable result. So here a standard model particle is a particle that fits well within our physical theories and that we have an understanding of. So this direct detection involves scattering of dark matter off the standard model particle. Then we have indirect detection, which involves the collision of two dark matter particles to produce an output in the standard model. So down here, so you have two collision of dark matter particles, and that produces two standard model particles, which we can then observe. Finally, the approach that we are most interested in is the production of dark matter particles at colliders. So we take two high energy beams of standard model particles, collide them together, and produce a dark matter signal, which we then hope to pick up. So what signals are we looking for? Well, in particular, we're looking for dark photon processes. The reason we're looking for dark photon processes is they have a particular distinctive signal that I'll explain. So a dark photon is a force-carrying particle among dark matter fields, just like a regular photon carries the electromagnetic force among regular matter, standard model matter fields. So it turns out that in our current models for dark photons, we have a decay mechanism from the Higgs boson, the newly discovered particle at the LHC, we have a decay mechanism from this Higgs boson into a photon, a regular photon, and a dark photon. But since a dark photon is a dark matter particle, it doesn't interact with light and we can't observe it. So really the only thing we observe in a detector is a single photon and a missing transfer of energy in the opposite direction. So this single photon signature is the signature we're looking for for dark matter. However, not every monophoton signature is dark matter. There are several standard model background processes. Many decays that occur entirely within the standard model result in the same final state of a single photon. For instance, we could have a Z boson decaying into two neutrinos and a photon. And since we can't observe the neutrinos, we would also observe only a photon, but it's entirely standard model, no dark matter. We, have, we could also have non-interaction background. A single photon could be emitted without even a collision having occurred. Finally, the most important background that we're concerned with is actually the false identification of photons. So electrons and hadrons, or jets, look very similar to photons in a detector. How do we tell apart photons? Well, for the CMS experiment in 2016, there was a particular photon identification mechanism, which we used to tell apart photon events in the detector. We first have the electron-photon distinction, which occurs in the very innermost chamber of the CMS detector, the tracking chamber. Because an electron is a charged particle, it has a small initial release of charged particles, which is known as a pixel. And we can use that to identify it. Because a photon is uncharged, it will not leave a pixel. So presence of a pixel means electron. No pixel is photon. <coughs> to distinguish photons from jets, we use information from outer regions of the detector. So in the hadronic calorimeter, we look at the energy deposited there. And we also look at the shower shape of the event, as well as the charge hadron isolation, 
which measures the amount of energy that goes into the production of charged hadrons. So these factors can be used to tell apart photons from jets. However, this photon ID is not perfect, and we in end up letting in many false positives and false negatives. And these can sort of be summarized by four different quantities. So first we have the electron fake rate, which gives us a handle on how often electrons are falsely recognized as photons, so false positives. We then have the electron photon efficiency, which is how often that photons are rejected by the electron photon ID, or false negatives. We also have similar quantities for jets. The photon jet purity tells, gives us a handle on how often jets fake photons. And the electron jet efficiency gives us a handle on how often photons are rejected by the jet ID. Each quantity is dependent on the transverse momentum of particles within the detector. And we're especially interested in this dependence because the different signal regions for the dark photon process occur in different ranges of transverse momentum. So we're interested in finding the fake rates and efficiencies in different bins of transverse momentum in order to analyze the photon ID in the regions at which we're trying to detect dark photons. We calculated these four quantities by two main methods, the tag and probe method and the purity test method, which I'll explain shortly. So for tag and probe, we can use it to determine the electron fake rate and the jet efficiency. The, the basic idea behind tag and probe involves the use of the known process where a Z boson decays into an electron and a positron, Z to E plus E minus. We can take one of these electrons and place a tight selection on it to ensure that it really is an electron. And then we can look at the properties of the other one to see whether or not it passes the electron photon ID. If it, if it leaves a pixel, we have an electron-electron final state, and there's no fake. But if it doesn't leave a pixel, we interpret it as a photon. We have an electron-photon final state, and there is a fake. So the electron-photon fake rate is simply the ratio of the number of electron photons over the number of electron-electrons. So the number of fakes to the number of true identified electrons. We can also compute the electron jet, the photon jet efficiency. Since electrons and photons are essentially the same outside of the pixel detector, we can use the electrons generated by the Z to EE decay. And we can test them against the jet ID. So the number of them passing the jet ID over the total number of them would be the electron jet efficiency. To determine the photon jet purity and the photon jet efficiency, we use a different method called purity testing. Essentially, we plot all of the events we observe to the variable sigma iota iota, which is a measure of the shower spread of events in the detector, so how wide the event branches out. Then we generate background templates for, we, we generate templates for both the photon signal and the jet background. So events for, uh, we generate templates for both the true photons and the jet phase. And then we fit the data to a linear combination of these. And the variable p jet over here is simply the photon jet purity. So the independent variable in our fit is the quantity we're trying to get. We can also determine the electron photon efficiency by performing two of these fits. But on one of these fits, we employ the pixel veto as well. So the number of them passing both the jet ID and the pixel veto over the number just passing the jet ID would be the electron photon efficiency. So given these methods, here are our results for the electron photon fake rate. So we can see a fairly constant dependence in the transverse momentum PT over lower and high PT, uh, high PT ranges over the different regions of analysis for the dark photon production. We did a similar thing for the electron photon efficiency, although there was not enough data for the lower PT ranges in the electron photon efficiency. We also calculated values for simulated data for the electron photon efficiency. We did a similar thing for the photon jet purity and for the photon jet efficiency, and we obtained similar results. So these results have great significance in the study of dark photon experiments. Even though they reflect the imperfections inherent in the photon ID, they're still invaluable in calculating the true dark photon signal amid the backgrounds that I talked about earlier. The, photon jet, the electron photon fake rate and the photon jet purity are used to calculate the number of photons and the number of electrons and the number of jets that fake photons and that contribute to our overall photon signal. And the efficiencies are used to calculate a scaling factor 
between the simulated data and the true data, because not every photon is identified by the true data, so we, so we actually need to scale our simulated data. This is not all, though. We can also use our data that we collected with the photon IDs, with the fake rates and efficiencies of the photon ID, to figure out how to optimize the photon ID. To maximize the significance of the photon signal in the signal region that we choose by our photon ID, it turns out that we have to maximize the product of efficiency times purity. And it turns out for the current CMS 2016 ID, the photon ID is far too restrictive and ends up excluding too many events to a statistically significant degree. So in the future, we know that we need to make the photon ID less restrictive, but we hope to determine the exact values of the cuts to determine the right signal region in which to pick up photons. So to conclude, I'd like to acknowledge my mentors, Professor Christoph Voss and Brandon Allen, who were invaluable and provided tremendous guidance along the way. I'd also like to tr uh, thank my collaborators in the lab, um, as well as my tutor, Ina, uh, last week TAs, and RSI, CEE, and MIT, and my sponsor, Mr. Siddharth Chennai. Great work, uh, Sanjay. You were so excited about that project. Um, somebody told me, actually, after they heard your presentation, I wasn't there for it, so this is the first time I heard it, but they said, wow, that was like a religious experience. I feel like I understand this now. So good job. Um, does anybody have questions? Yes. So could you, could you go through the, the results slide? It's like slide 12, I guess. Or, yeah, so why do you think that the results were similar in when you did it, the, the second and third iterations, you did it. And, and can you explain how the results were similar? You sort, of, you sort of went through these graphs a little bit too fast. Yeah, that's the time was running out. <laughs> <laughs> too fast for me. Yeah, so the, the results were, are you talking about the results being similar between the efficiency calculations and the, and the phase rate yeah. calculations? Yeah. Um, well, they're not actually, so basically, the, in the calculation of the efficiency, we observe a pretty constant trend throughout PT. I mean, we do see a bit of a dip here, but large uncertainties essentially wash out this feature. And as we see in the fake rate, it's also a pretty similar trend throughout PT. Um, we didn't actually expect to find too significant dependence on PT for the, these fake rates because it's mostly a detector-dependent property. We just want to analyze the the like the differences if there are any because we need the values across different PT ranges. Um, yeah, Lina. So how is the decay mechanism of the Higgs boson into the photon, the dark photon discovered? So the Higgs, me the decay mechanism into a photon and a dark photon is not actually, it's, it's not actually been discovered yet. It's only a model which we use to observe dark photons for dark matter. So. A current model for um, dark photons is that they are an analog of the regular photon, which is just a U1 gauge field for standard model fields. Um, so we have a U1 gauge field among dark sector fields. So we think of a, a dark photon as a particle like that, and we postulate an extra term that couples that dark photon to the Higgs based on the properties of that field in our overall theory. So the, your, found, your project essentially rests on the foundation of that model. That's correct. Okay. Although we haven't, in, in particle physics, we actually have not found any conclusive evidence that any one model is correct. We're trying many different models at once, and this seems like one of the most plausible and easily detectable dark matter, dark matter models. Other questions? Um, yes. Oh, as a data scientist, I guess I'm interested in how much data you had to analyze. A lot. <laughs> so this data is coming from the CMS detector at the Large Hadron Collider, yep. and many, many events are being recorded. Um, so I don't know the exact values of the, lumi of the beam luminosities of the LHC, but I would say that the amount of data we had to analyze was on the order of like 100 gigs. 
<laughs> um, yes. In the astrophysical context, what would be producing all these dark photons? To, and, and are there okay. mechanisms in vision that would make enough to, to okay. make up for the rotation velocity curve? Okay, so the dark photon, we don't actually, we, we're not actually sure if the dark photon is what is producing the discrepancy between the ro rotational velocity curve. The reason we're analyzing the dark photon is that the dark photon is a gauge field between dark matter fields. So we're, we're postulating that there exists many different dark matter fields, and the dark photon is a force carrier between those dark matter fields that satisfies some sort of weak coupling to the standard model that makes it observable. Of course, if there were no coupling, we wouldn't be able to observe it at all. So the reason we're looking for the dark photon is because of that telltale monophoton signature. So that makes it one of the easiest things to look for, but the dark photon is not necessarily what is comprising the discrepancy in mass. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, yes. So it seems like, uh, if I understand, you should be able to use this to figure out kind of what the lowest threshold of a real signal you could determine is. Is that something that we're actually feasible, like, is it feasible that we can gather that data, or do we have to make the detectors better before we can do that? So, the data gathering has actually been going on for quite a while, and the purpose of this project is to further that analysis and optimize the photon ID and determine where we're falling short in our signal region. Um, currently, no, no results have been observed to the threshold that we have currently, like, no, no results have been observed to the threshold that we want, the five sigma threshold, so we don't have any conclusive evidence of their existing dark photons. However, we're optimistic that with our modifications to the cuts that we propose here, we might be able to isolate a better signal region in which we might be able to find more st statistically significant photon signals. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Sanjay.